Well, thank you very much, uh, Ed, for, for a very stimulating uh, lecture, uh, maybe also a salutary one, actually, uh, should be said. So we have time for a few questions. Uh, so if you'd like to raise your hand and uh, just wait for the microphone to get to you. Uh, and when it does, please uh, say who you are and uh, any affiliation you have. I think I saw a hand somewhere here. Uh, okay, there's one here and one here. Okay. Please. Um, thank you, Ed. Um, fascinating talk. Um, it's Leo Hickman from Carbon Brief website. Um, you touched on, you know, the hu from Guy Callender onwards, the kind of the huge journey climate science has been on. If you had a nominal pot of 10 million, 100 million, what would you focus the research on? So we know there's a few known unknowns within climate science. Where would you, if you had the decision to make, where would you focus that research money now? That's an excellent question. Um, if I'm not trying not be not be biased. <laughs> um, so I would certainly try and make more use of these historical records. I think that's, that's vital. The, you know, the UK has the probably the, one of the largest undigitized archives anywhere in the world. Um, but you know, other than that, I think we still need to know more about clouds. You know, I think that's a, that's a big area that we have to think about. How are, how are clouds going to change in future? That kind of is one big key question which we have to worry about. You know, because we have choices to make about our emissions but there's then uncertainty about how much warming those emissions will cause. Uh, and a large part of that uncertainty is due to what has happened with clouds in the future. Um, we have to understand, I think, where there might be some thresholds in the system. You know, what temperature might we start lose, commit to losing Greenland, for example? You know, the seven metres of sea level tied up on Greenland. Um, and at some point, we'll reach a temperature where we'll commit to losing Greenland. You know, seven metres of sea level rise. It will take centuries for that sea level rise to occur, but we could commit ourselves to that happening um, at one and a half or two degrees potentially. So that is a big issue which we need to try and understand. Where are those thresholds that we might want to try and avoid really rather seriously? Um, yeah, hopefully that helps. There's a question over here. Uh, and then a couple at the back, but we'll take this one first. Hi, thank you. Um, this might be a bit controversial, but what can you say about climate change and animal agriculture, if that's anything you Animal can speak agriculture. About? Yeah, if you can speak about that. Okay. Um, so agriculture in general and um, animal agriculture is obviously um, a source of greenhouse gas emissions, methane particularly. Um, and so we have some very difficult decisions to make about agriculture. And the emissions reductions from agriculture are really rather difficult. So agriculture is one of the areas where we are likely to have to balance the emissions that come from agriculture with negative emissions or somehow removing greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. We might need to make some very difficult choices about what food we eat. You know, and the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report said that essentially one of the things we could do is eat less meat, particularly cows and sheep, because they produce a lot of methane. Uh, and often... Um, what we see is that we're, trees are being chopped down in the tropics and the deforestation is occurring to grow food for cattle. And so, again, we're seeing destruction of rainforests to grow food for cattle, um, as well as for grazing cattle. So um, that is a major source of greenhouse gas emissions. And it's you know, one of the things that we could all do if we wanted to help this problem is by cutting down the amount of meat we eat. I have personally done that. <laughs> We'll take this question here. I think someone... Well, yes, because it's a proximity to the microphone. And then we'll take a couple of questions at the back after that. Uh, hello. My name's Randall Boydell. I'm an architect and sustainable development consultant. I'm going to play devil's advocate. Uh, you, you said we have difficult choices to make. I'm going to suggest we have choices to make, and they're not necessarily difficult, depending on how we frame the argument. And there are actually lots of net wins and win-win situations we get out of this. Yeah, I mean, there are certainly some no-regret choices that we could easily make, I agree. Um, and there are, you know, undoubtedly some opportunities um, that we could make the most of this situation with. So there are certain choices we can make relatively easily, but, you know, there are choices about how fast we might do something. And I think that's a very difficult choice. You know, if we have to replace all of our gas heating in this country, how quickly could we do that? 
You know, that is a very difficult decision to make about how, you know, how we pay for everyone's gas boilers to be replaced, for well, example. Well, the challenge is not necessarily difficult. It's how we frame the argument. <laughs> okay, it's, it's expensive, <laughs> depending on how fast we do it. You know, and you know, whether you know, that cost is what the politicians would like to accept is the difficult question. So I think we have a couple of questions at the back. So we'll take one on this side first, on your right, and then the next one on the left. Hello there. Um, great lecture. Shame you didn't do paleoclimatology if your clock stops around about Industrial Revolution yes. OK. Just having spent some time hanging out with the XR mob, going, we're all doomed, it's the end, panic stations, scream and shout, but we're all 21, aren't we? The point is, um, could you tell us a little bit by degrees or 1.5 degrees here or there, what effect we are to expect to see on the base of diversity of life? And are we to expect some kind of creeping sterilization? Not a complete sort of Martian nowhereville dries a bone, but mm -hmm. what is going to happen to the variety of life that we depend upon at the moment? So we can certainly look back into the past, the very deep past, and try and infer some things about what happened in the past. So I think, I mean, look, looking to the future, I think the, the most obvious example of um, issues for ecosystems are the coral reefs, the warm coral, warm water corals. The, you know, the, the inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has suggested we will lose almost all of our warm water corals by two degrees above pre-industrial levels. Um, we'll have issues in the Arctic if the sea ice continues to melt. Um, ecosystem changes in the Arctic are also very important. So the, the paleo record also tells us a lot about sea level rise. So we, we mentioned Greenland, for example. So the last time temperatures were as this warm in, back in the deep past, we know that sea levels were tens of metres higher than they are today. It may take centuries or millennia to get there, but we could well commit ourselves to that level of sea level rise um, because that's what we, we know has happened in the past when we've been at temperatures to similar levels or just above today. Do we have a question, I think, there? Uh, hi, Ed. Thanks for the great talk. It was fascinating to hear how we've actually known about global warming for over 80 years, as you're saying. Um, also fascinating to see how only in the last couple of years has there really been a kind of a, a zeitgeist across the population here and across the world around doing something different. I guess it all started with the um, banning straw, um, straws campaign. From your perspective, where do you think the average citizen can put their pressure behind? Um, should it be in engaging with governments and getting our politicians behind this journey, or should it be in engaging with businesses who, you know, you can argue are the predominant polluters in this case and the drivers behind the increase in um, temperatures? Um, so I think the answer is everywhere. <laughs> and I think actually the, the one, the most important thing we all need to do, I think, is talk about it. Talk about it a lot more. Keep talking about it all the time. Because if, you know, if, if then becomes an issue which people vote about, for example, then that is when politicians might start to, to listen. Um, so if this is an issue you feel very passionate about, talk about it and then make it a... Um, mention it if a, if a local council candidate comes knocking on the door or your your local European election candidate comes knocking on the door, um, mention it as a key issue. So if, you know, if that's important to you, then, then you should do that. We should also talk to businesses, and we do that in, in the research community. We, we talk to businesses about the risks that are coming and what they might do to, to respond. Um, I think they're very well aware. The, insur the insurance industry is certainly very aware of the risks that we face. Um, what do we do with the fossil fuel companies? They, you know, they have, they're going to have to make some difficult decisions as well about where their business goes. Um, but no, we have to... There's no magic bullet for, for any of this, right? There's no magic bullet for solving it. There's no magic bullet for, um, for how we motivate um, any actions that we might want to see. So we have to do everything, talk to ourselves, each other, uh, businesses and politicians. Okay, we have, we'll have one more, uh, I think, question from down here at the front. Well, halfway, not quite the front. Yes, <laughs> perfect. Thanks so much for a fascinating talk. Vedanta Kumar here from Bayes, actually, from government. But this is a, a science question. Um, you showed a map of data points that you had from um, going back at, I think, at the time of the storm in 1903. Yeah. But I guess to inform 
when we talk about adaptation, a lot of the time we focus on developing countries or low-lying countries like Bangladesh, which are going to be hit. To what extent do we have data points for those countries that are more, like, more likely to be severely affected? Mm -hmm. So I mean, we are very lucky in the UK that we've had a lot of observations taken and um, lots of countries in Africa and Asia are not so lucky that they haven't had um, the detailed observations taken for, for as long. There are undoubtedly large archives in every single country in the world of data which hasn't been used. So you know, I've, I've been at various meetings where we've had representatives from all over the world talking about the paper records that they have, for example, which haven't been digitised. Africa, Asia... Um, all over the place, um, South America as well. Um, so, you know, we, we do have lots of records. We need to make sure that all those records are available as well. That isn't always the case, you know. Data is not always publicly available or even to scientists available. It can often be kept in country, which is another big issue that we face. Um, and that is another issue that we have to address politically and diplomatically um, and access some of this data to improve our records. Um, so yeah, it, it often involves talking to, to local scientists if we want to get access to the, some of this data. Um, but yeah, there's always more out there. Okay, I think on that note, uh, that's an excellent uh, point to finish. Thanks very much, Ed, once again. Thank you. Well, Thank you. before you go, I have one very important task. I hope the scroll is under here. Yes, here we are to perform, which you must all witness to make sure that it's all done properly. So this is the scroll which, which uh, Ed will receive. I'm, I'm assured that the money has been transferred to his bank account already. <laughs> I haven't checked, but he'll no doubt tell us if it hasn't. So Ed, thank you very much thank and you. congratulations thank you. once again. Thank you, Matt. Thank you.